Welcome back, y'all. In this video, I'm going to be making potassium nitrite from potassium nitrate and lead using heat. Potassium nitrite isn't used as often as sodium nitrite because the former is deliquescent, while the latter is just hygroscopic. Deliquescence is a property of some substances having such a high affinity for water that they absorb moisture from the atmosphere and form solutions. Basically, if left in non-dry air, they turn into little puddles. Common examples of deliquescent salts being zinc chloride and sodium hydroxide. Hygroscopy is a step down from deliquescence, that is, hygroscopic substances do absorb water from the air, but they don't readily dissolve in the water that they absorb. In general, nitrite salts, usually sodium nitrate, they're used in food preservation, most notably meat curing to give meat a pinkish red color, to produce diazo dyes, to treat cyanide poisoning, and a lot more. If you want to read more about nitrite's uses, check out the Wikipedia page for sodium nitrate since it is the more used salt. If you do check it out, there is a subsection on people using it to commit suicide, which I won't go into, but because of a lawsuit brought against Amazon last year, it got a lot of attention. Since then, I haven't been able to find sodium nitrate for sale online, or potassium nitrite for that matter and I want to use it in some diazotization reactions, so I found this synthesis of potassium nitrite instead. I don't know if this reaction would work to produce sodium nitrite from sodium nitrate because both salts decompose at lower temperatures than the potassium analogs. I might try it and post something about it in the future, but for now I stuck with making potassium nitrite because of the higher thermal stability. One indirect way to make sodium nitrite from potassium nitrite is by using it to convert an alcohol like isopropyl, butyl, or amyl into the respective alkyl nitrite, isolate it, and hydrolyze it with sodium hydroxide to get sodium nitrite and regenerate the alcohol. Nerd Rage has a video on making isopropyl nitrite from isopropyl alcohol and nitrosyl sulfuric acid, which is cool. It's an interesting way to do that without a nitrite salt, which is more typical, but they're just not as accessible as they used to be. He also posted another lab notes video covering him failing to hydrolyze the isopropyl nitrite, which he did with sodium hydroxide in methanol. I don't know if it's because it was isopropyl nitrite or why, but it didn't work. It just decomposed. I don't know, maybe isopropyl nitrite's thermal stability is lower than the higher analogs like butyl or isoamyl nitrites. But I, in addition to trying this same reaction I'm about to do with sodium nitrate to get sodium nitrite, I might try the alkyl nitrite decomposition because I have both butanol and isoamyl alcohol and I want sodium nitrite. All right. Let's get to the video. So, what did I do? I mixed lead and potassium nitrate in a steel cup and put it on a propane camp stove burner. I also used two propane torches to speed up the heating. The lead I bought ingots on Amazon, melted them down, poured them in water, and then cut up the little streams that formed into those little slivers that you see. So I mix them in there and I have a piece of rebar to help with the stirring. And then I get to heating. Once the lead and potassium nitrate melted, I continually stirring this with rebar throughout the reaction, whether or not it's seen on camera, but uh, I basically just have to wait now. And once it starts bubbling, the reaction starts. The color change is the main indicator, of, other than the bubbling, of the progress of the reaction. So lead 2 oxide, which is what's formed in this reaction, has two polymorphs, a yellow one known as litharge and a red one known as massicot. The red form is produced at lower temperatures, the yellow form is produced at higher temperatures. I think it's 489 degrees is the transition temperature, but it starts off red and as the reaction proceeds and it gets hotter, it turns yellow. You'll see this shortly. The procedure I used said to first heat it at a low red heat until the lead becomes, for the most part, oxidized, and to oxidize the remainder to increase the heat to visible redness and keep it there for half an hour. I don't have a proper furnace, so I didn't do that. I just did it until it went chunky. 
Afterwards, I tried to pour it into some water, but it was pretty much all solidified at that point, so it didn't work. So I dumped water into the cup to extract the contents. I dislodged the lead oxide with the chisel and a hammer, and then went to filtering the solution. I spilled some, but not very much, and I just washed the paper towel with water a couple times, and it seemed to get anything out of it. After filtering, I'm left with this weirdly fluorescent neon -y yellow solution, which is kind of weird, and transferred it to a beaker, and I'm going to weigh the lead oxide later just to see how much of that I got. I set up a CO2 generator from calcium carbonate and hydrochloric acid, bubbled it in, and the CO2 reacts with any soluble lead salts that formed in the reaction, along with some contaminants from the steel cup. It's mainly lead though, uh, which is why the precipitate is white, because lead carbonate is white. Well, it's basic lead carbonate, but whatever. Then I filtered it, and I had a less fluorescent solution, which is good, but now it's about to get ugly because I bubbled hydrogen sulfide generated from iron 2 sulfide and hydrochloric acid into the solution, which, because potassium nitrite is basic, it forms some um, sulfides when it runs out of metals to react with. Metal sulfides are notoriously insoluble other than alkali and alkaline earth metals. So this is just to remove those impurities that weren't fully removed by the CO2 bubbling. The sulfides that precipitated were too fine to filter thoroughly, so I boiled the solution and allowed it to cool to get the particles to agglomerate and become filterable. This worked pretty well, and I filtered it. I boiled down the filtrate, let it cool, filtered it again, and bubbled more hydrogen sulfide through the filtrate. This was a mistake in retrospect, and all it did was introduce more sulfide impurities, as can be seen by the color of the solution darkening. I'm pretty sure they're just polysulfides, but those will mostly get removed later. So I, I moved on. I boiled the solution down and started doing the arduous task of adding a bunch of denatured alcohol to it, boiling it down, adding more alcohol, boiling it down, adding more alcohol, and so on. Because potassium nitrite is slightly soluble in alcohol and obviously extremely soluble in water, the aqueous solution forms a separate layer. I don't know why it turns bluish green. I think it might be iron impurities, but I don't know why they wouldn't have been removed by treating it with hydrogen sulfide. Oh well. Upon heating, the potassium nitrite becomes more soluble in the alcohol, so some water migrates into the alcoholic layer and evaporates off. This repeated treatment helps to lighten the yellowish coloration in the solution. I think the sulfides present are significantly more soluble in alcohol than the potassium nitrite water solution, so they stay in solution, while the potassium nitrite eventually separates out as a white, slightly blue-tinted solid, bluish-green, uh, which I filter off and immediately transfer to my vacuum desiccator over concentrated sulfuric acid. I concentrated the filtrate further, doing the same thing I did before, and got two more crops of product, though the third crop looks pretty janky. I spilled a little of the second crop twice when moving other stuff in and out of the desiccator, but it's okay. Second and third crops are usually less pure, so I wasn't too worried about spilling any. In the end, I have some nice, free-flowing, not wet, potassium nitrite. I evaporated the rest of the alcohol solution to dryness, and all that was left is this gunk. Normally, I would titrate the potassium nitrite samples to determine their purity, but I'm waiting on some chemicals to be delivered, so I did a qualitative test instead. I'll be doing more videos with potassium nitrite prepared this way, so I'll include titration results in them. Room temperature concentrated sulfuric acid doesn't react with potassium nitrate, but it does react with potassium nitrite, and it should copiously evolve nitrogen dioxide when I do so. Here, I do that, and the test, thankfully, shows a positive result. Because I spilled some of the potassium nitrite in the desiccator and it got in the sulfuric acid, some nitrogen dioxide was evolved and contaminated the second and third crops of the salt. Both still gave positive test results upon the addition of concentrated sulfuric acid, so all the crops contain mainly potassium nitrite. The combined weight of all three crops ended up being 61.73 grams and 
assuming 100% purity, even though the second and third crops definitely aren't, represents a 72.31% yield. I'm very happy with this given the rough reaction conditions and the cheapness of the starting materials. The lead oxide and unreacted lead mixture weighed 217.15 grams. Based on the 72.31% assumed yield, I calculated that the mixture should have weighed 219.45 grams, but I couldn't chisel all of it out of the steel reaction cup, so I'd say it's close enough. The lead oxide is also useful for me because it's amphoteric, meaning it can react with both acids and bases, so I can readily prepare many lead compounds from it. Metallic lead is far less reactive and thus harder to make some compounds from directly. That's about all I've got. Thank you for watching. Like, comment, and or subscribe if you want to, and I'll see you in the next video.